Okay, so just to introduce myself, my name's Judy Adnam and I work here at Macquarie University. Um, I teach your student teachers or your first year out teachers um, how to teach history in the secondary school, society and culture, legal studies and how to manage their time, which seems to be um, what I do more of than teaching them about how to teach. So um, I've been doing that since 20... Um, 10 this time around, but I did it when my, um, before that too, and then I took some time off to um, help my sons finish their HSC. And I don't know how much help I was, but I made a lot of meals and cup of teas and so on. Probably your parents are doing the same sort of thing. Um, but before that, I um, started teaching um, in 19, well, 1983. Um, so I know, I know. I can teach history really well because I was there for most of it. Um, so I've called my talk, um, my journey from student to teacher to student to teacher. And the reason for that was because uh, when I left school, I went into um, university and teacher training. Um, and, but I haven't stopped studying really since then. And I'm just about to start my um, PhD. So I've done my master's in education, how to engage students of your age. Uh, and how to make education worthwhile, really. And it's been the most rewarding time of my life. I love my job. I've got the best job in the world, and I think your teachers would agree that on most days they have the best job in the world too, and you would know that um, just by the time that you mix with them. Um, so that's enough about me, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that because you're here, you're thinking about um, what you want to do and whether you want to go to university and how well you'll go in the HSC and it's a pretty big year really um, and I still remember how stressed I was you know just writing practice essays and so on so I'll just move on um, but please at any time that you like if you have questions don't wait till the end you can either type them um, online or unmute your mute button and speak to me and we'll talk about anything. When I wrote this presentation, I was thinking about what I knew in June of my HSC year. And I thought I knew everything and I, I knew a lot, but I didn't know anything much. So I just thought you'd like to see where I started. And I want you now to sort of think about uh, what's led you on your journey to even thinking about um, being a, a teacher uh, and I think that if I asked all of you to think back about your years in um, from kindergarten on, there are teachers that particularly stick in your mind. And that, that's for good and bad reasons. Uh, and I just know, and I chose this particular picture because that teacher there, Mr Scala, in the middle, used to play us classical music and take us out to... Um, to look after roses every Friday afternoon if we'd been good in class and it was just really relaxing and I found that um, I was always stressed at school, I don't know why, um, but doing that introduced me to classical music and to gardening and I haven't mastered either of them at the moment but Mr Scala showed me a world outside of my world um, and for me that was the start of thinking about becoming a teacher and at that stage I wanted to be a primary teacher. Um, but then I moved on and I and so I'm just showing you where I am now so I'm here in well that's where I live and that's where I had my education and I came from a fairly poor background and um, the idea of even finishing year 12 really wasn't on my mind because mum had left school in year 8 and Dad had left school in Year 9, and um, basically Mum was a housewife, and Dad worked two jobs to sort of provide for the four of us. So it was just um, really in our family culture that when you were old enough to leave school, you left school. And I had no problem with that because I didn't know anything else in the world outside of um, my parents' and family's um, aspirations for me. So. Um, you know, I know where you are because I'll show you very shortly where I ended up. So there I am, and that's my housing commission home and dog in the background. We always had a dog, so when you were upset about something, you could go and pat it. 
and I thought I was pretty groovy in those days. So there we are, just setting off to high school. Um, school badge, short uniform, you can see the hem, we tried to take them up a bit so they'd be shorter. Um, and that was my best friend, Susan. And there's my high school. So I started in high school, um, very high Aboriginal population, um, an Anglo-Saxon population, um, one of the poorest schools in New South Wales at the time, but a really happy place to be um, because everyone got on with everybody and we weren't too worried about education in Year 7, we were worried about people from the other primary schools. Um, but if I can show you right now the two most um, inspirational people, and I suppose this is my journey, we all have role models and um, sometimes we have mentors too and I think that they're really, really important for us. So I started out with no idea, you know, sort of assuming I'd work in the chemist or local Woolworths um, until I got married and then I'd have children. Um, and then I met Mrs Sulakovsky, this woman here, and Mr Mooney, this, this man here. And Mrs Sulakovsky was my Year 9 English teacher and Mr Mooney was my Year 11 Ancient History teacher. Um, and they were my, um, not just my role models, I thought they were the most amazing people and I could never imagine what it would be like to be a teacher, especially a woman working. Um, and this was in the day where women couldn't wear slacks to school. And Mrs Sulakovsky did something really memorable because in those days you had things called pantsuits. So you had a little top and you had pants and the top just barely covered your backside. Um, and the pants had very wide flares and the headmaster came into class and told Mrs Sulakovsky she couldn't wear pants because she was a woman. So in front of him she took them off. Well, you could see her underpants and she had an ample bottom, but she said, if this is what's more acceptable, this is what I'm going to do. And I was shocked, but I was also really delighted because I thought, here's a woman who's independent. Here's a woman who doesn't believe that she has to follow the rules or can show how ridiculous some rules are and I'm going to pay a lot of attention to this woman, not just to the English and poetry that she introduced me to, but how she lived her life, and she was always a very dignified woman. Mr Mooney, on the other hand, if I look back now, he was probably a pretty slack teacher, but again, just like Mr Scala, if it was a sunny day, he'd take us out onto the field so he could have his smoke, and he'd read us um, Her Herodotus from ancient history or he'd tell us about his trips overseas and we would be so um, in the moment and just so um, delighted with being transformed out of Newcastle to another place. And at that stage, I thought, I'd love to be like these people, but I can't, was in brackets, until they became my mentors. And Mrs Sulakovsky said to me, Judy, you know, you can do anything you like. If you um, work really hard, and you maintain a focus and you think about what you really want to do, not what you think is expected of you, but what you really want to do, you can do it. And I thought about it and I thought about Dad working for, you know, working two jobs. And I thought, well, I can't, Mrs Sulikovsky, because we don't have any money. Um, and the idea of working past Year 9 is quite selfish of me because the family needs money. But Mrs Sulikovsky and Mr Mooney came down to my house and introduced themselves to my um, parents and to my surprise mum and dad were actually supportive of the idea of finishing not just year 10 but year 12 and at that stage I realised that um, there were more openings in my world than just getting married and working in a chemist till I had a baby. So Mrs Sulikovsky and Mr Mooney then introduced me to these things and their scholarships and I opened this web page yesterday to see what was still available because you know we've got a new government and we've got a tight budget and some things you know money's really important and, and when I realised I had country schools I mean you guys are doing it tougher than than the city in a lot of cases so I thought well let's see what's available so the new um, support system is here uh, you can pay back your loan, but I really want you to seriously explore the scholarships and awards that are available, not just from the Australian government, but also for each of the universities. And many of the universities offer rural and regional support and special scholarships 
and a lot of them you might be surprised to know um, aren't accessed very often because people don't know they're there. So if you don't know what you don't know, then you can't apply for them. But have a look at some of these scholarships and talk to your teachers or your careers advisors about what's available to you. You know, and just, um, that's the Australian government one, but we also have, I know Macquarie has many of them. Go and explore the university or the college, the teacher's college that you want to go to and see what's available and please start applying now. That is what motivated me in all of those times when my friends were going out. It's a tough year, people have got their licences, um, people are turning 18, there's a, a reason for a party every weekend. However, think about the long term as you go on. Any questions so far? Okay. So my university was Newcastle University. I remember my very first English lecture and that's what it looked like. And I remember the lecturer down the front saying to, to the lecture theatre, um, well, look to the right and look to the left and only one of you will finish your degree and begin to teach. Now, rather than frighten me, that really motivated me to work even harder because it had been a long road to get to that point. I was on a scholarship at that stage thank goodness, because I still don't think I would have gone. But at the same time, I nearly died because my little world of high school in Newcastle became a massive world of all different people and I was really, really overwhelmed. And I'll say to you now, first year university <laughs> is, is just amazing. It's really, it's, um, it's a patchwork, it's a tapestry, but it's an easy place to drop out of too because there is such... It's so daunting, but most universities also have a first year experience and mentor um, sort of program. So please access those things. And even though my students now are in third and fourth year, I say to them there is support at the university just like there is at school, if not more. So if you need help, have a look at student services when you're exploring which university you want to go to. Okay, so I finished my degree. I Look, I failed a few essays, I cried in the corridor and sobbed on lecturers' shoulders, but if I really thought about it, it was because I was partying more than I was studying, <clears throat> and we won't go there, because the glitch finished and I got on with it. And so what I found most amazing, because Mr Mooney and Mrs Sulikovsky had introduced me to the world, and the first place I was going to go was to Greece because Mr Mooney said ancient Greece was just amazing. And I really, really wanted to explore the battlefields. <clears throat> and stupid me, um, one of the stupid things I did when I got to um, Greece was I went to Sparta. And if you um, have studied the ancient Spartans, you know that they don't really have much of a legacy because they didn't really build anything to last <clears throat> apart from their army. So I went to Sparta and there was a sign there that said this is where old Sparta was and it was just like another village because there was no legacy. <clears throat> Silly me, I'm, I never told Mr Mooney that but I'm telling you. But when I was in Australia the, um, I had to wait for a while to get a teaching job because it was an 18 month wait even though I said I'd go anywhere in New South Wales. And again, you know, still being in contact with Mr Mooney and Mrs Sulikovsky, they said, well, why don't you go elsewhere? Why don't you teach around the world? Everywhere, everywhere wants teachers. And I thought, oh, I'd never thought about that. So I sold my V-dub and I ended up in Greece because that's as far as my um, ticket could afford. And I started teaching in Greece. And, you know, travelled around the islands on the weekend, taught English as a second language and got to see the sites, those sites. But let's go back to you. Um, let's have a look at how can you get to university. So some of you might be sitting there going, um, I don't have the money, but now Judy's shown me how I can get the money, but I'm not sure if I'm um, smart enough. And I want you to think that while it is a very important year, this isn't the only way to get to university. Now, every single university, so thinking about the universities that you actually want to go to, um, have different pathways. So if you don't get the UAI or the ATAR that you actually need, 
please just Google Pathways to University or, and then go to the Pathways for your, um, you know, the university you wanted to. Just on that, I applied for every single university that I could possibly um, get into and I applied for courses lower than what I needed to get into teaching. Why did I do that? I knew that once I got to university, regardless of the course I was in, I could change after first year if my results at university were okay to get into another program. So don't think if you don't get into your course that that's the end of it. Don't think that if you don't get the ATAR that that's the end of it. If you can get into university, fantastic. If your ATAR isn't good enough, look at all of the alternatives. So I just want to speak about a few of these. The first one is if you don't have an, in, an insufficient, if you don't have the ATAR you want, there are things called foundation programs. And I know that um, you can do that particular course. And, um, if, and, you know, it's another year of study. It's sort of like year 12 plus sort of thing. You generally do less subjects. You're in a university environment. You get the feel of it. You have to pass that before you can move on to first year. But... Um, that is something that you should be exploring. If you decide that you want to work for a while or travel or have a gap year or, or do whatever you're doing, then the next thing that you might be doing is going to a mature age scheme where I think after 21 in many universities, uh, you can apply for that scheme. So again, it's not so much about your ATAR, it's about your age and your experience. There are other things as well. Um, so, you can see here, and we might even click on this one, the other thing too is if you feel that you need special consideration, something happen has happened in your life this year, <coughs> excuse me, that stops you from going to university, and that is a massive range of things. Um, <coughs> have a look at these sorts of things. And these sorts of things, a rural bonus scheme. Again, most universities have these. So while we don't really have time to submit these, to explore these further at the moment, definitely have a look at what is available and what you are eligible for. So don't think a high ATAR is the only way to go. The other thing I did want to mention is just say that you think you'd like to go to TAFE to start with. If you have a Cert 4 in many cases, that's enough to enter you into university as well. So <coughs> you might be studying, um, well, say engineering, for example. Your Cert 4 in engineering may get you into first year university, again, depending on your results. So I'm not even going to explore that further, but you can see there that there is an awful lot available to you right now at the moment. Please take time to consider it. Okay, so there is my beautiful um, view of the Parthenon. I was very well paid as an um, English as a second language teacher. I lived in a penthouse in Greece. I thought my life was perfect until I tried to swap the drachma for Australian dollars and then I realised I was poor again, unfortunately. So I, at Easter in Greece, I got a phone call from my mother telling me that I'd been posted to Condoblin as my first teaching subject and I most certainly don't need to tell you where that is, do I? Um, but I know that its claim to fame is it's the centre of New South Wales, so that's where I began teaching. There it is now. And I went out um, last year because it was my 30th year of anniversary of teaching and I was so thrilled to see that some of the students that I'd actually taught were now teaching back in Condoblin and one's actually the deputy principal in the primary school. And that was just a joyous time for me because by the time you're third year out, you're one of the most experienced staff members. So you get a lot of, ex lot of opportunities to do things that you mightn't get to do in the city. We used to go to Dubbo for shopping because their shops weren't real good in Condoblin and um, you had to buy things in bulk. Okay, so if I'm talking about a day in the life of a teacher, uh, please don't make the dreadful mistake of saying it's great holidays and you start at 9 and finish at 
Is that right, miss? Yeah. So generally, um, when I finish teaching in a high school, but even now, like you, you're probably getting up and you're checking your Facebook or you're checking your texts or you're doing something. Well, so do we. And we check emails and I'm checking emails from students because if they've got five minutes spare, rather than read a website, it's easier to t text me or email me. So I generally check them in the morning. Then I get ready for my day. So I have to pack, you know, up everything, including lunch and coffee. So I'll leave home. Now, um, just say in a typical day, I might have my roll call, photocopying, first, you know, talk to the um, other staff members, check on homework, take phone calls from parents, check my role, um, and then I start to teach. So I might start with Year 9 History, for example. I need to have that lesson planned. I can't go in and just have a yarn to them. Um, and so you can see that by the time lunch is on, I haven't really had a break. So by that stage, I may rush to the toilet. Chances are I'll have some detentions, maybe a playground duty, maybe making some phone calls, maybe helping students like you with their revision. Um, 12.30 might be a free period, and that might be where I say, come and see me because I've got this time off. I might be trying to photocopy. You can see the serious end of the day is after lunch. Um, usually the year 12 class is my reward. And um, that's the class that I usually love most because we get to actually talk history and talk about um, exams and, um, you know, talk almost to adults as you are right now. Um, then that's the end of the day at school. Then at night. Then I go home and I might mark, write reports, have parent-teacher interviews, have some sort of school functions, maybe organise excursions, recover from excursions, be on excursions, and all of the other things. Now, I know that in Condobolin, oh, you couldn't even go shopping and it was virtually parent-teacher interview. So I'm sure Manila's like that, and I'm pretty sure Dubbo would have a component of that. If your parents see the teachers in the, um, you know, in the shops, then they'll stop and they'll say, how's, so, how's my child going? And that's pretty normal. Now, it was all right for me in Condobolin when I was young because Friday night was pub night, and then you spoke to even more parents, but you had to sort of behave yourself. And so I became more sporting because it was dangerous to be too social in case a story got out about you and you know what country towns are like. Um, so what other opportunities are there for teachers? You know, look, I loved teaching so much and I loved students. So if you don't like if you don't like adolescence or if you're early childhood or, or um, primary, if you don't like students, please choose another career. Because if you don't like students, you're not interested in them, you're not going to get along with them. Can you think of those teachers? Probably not in your schools, I hope. But if you don't like students, it's like being a painter and saying, I hate painting. Don't do it, please. But think about all of the other opportunities I've had over the years. And look at me now, you know, I'm teaching teachers how to teach. I've got the best job in the whole wide world, apart from a high school teacher. Um, but all of those things, HSC marking, NAPLAN marking, writing, writing textbooks, reviewing textbooks, writing websites, um, making videos, consulting other teachers, talking to other teachers through networks, working around the world. They're all things I've done, all things I never believed I'd I do, but all of those things are amazing opportunities. Becoming a principal, becoming a deputy principal, becoming a head teacher. So all of those things are amazing. And then if you, if your, you know, spouse or partner or even yourself has an interest to go anywhere, everyone wants a teacher. Most people want someone who speaks English. So you don't actually have to teach English. You can teach English as a second language. And many countries don't have education systems like us, so you get the textbook that you work out of as well. So lucky me, I get to work here, I get to graduate. It was the most joyous day of my life when I got my master's. But have a look at this. Here's my classroom. Here they are doing a role play. These are all teachers now. Some of them are in the country. There they are, their most joyous moment as well. And there they are saying goodbye to me. So I'll leave that for the moment and um, just ask, leave you now. It's a great job. Congratulations on thinking about it. Study hard. Thank you.